I want to talk about the European Union. Talking about the European Union is difficult. Once again, we start with our usual warning and caveat. These are complex concerns. But in turning our attention to the European Union, we're concerned with something quite peculiar, quite unique, in fact, in world history. And that is a supranational legal political organisation. The peculiarity of Europe is just this for those countries that are part of the European Union. They're faced with um, a very demanding set of challenges. How nation states, who are normally sovereign, are to be part of this supranational legal and political order. I suppose analysing this issue begs a number of uh, pressing questions. I guess the first question I'd like to address is the question of why. Why the European Union? Time prevents me from going into these interesting issues in any great detail, but I think what I could say is that the origins of the European Union lie in the reconstruction of Europe after 1945, after the Second World War. If one looks back at European history, one can see that one of the pressure points, one of the flashpoints, uh, was on mainland Europe wars between the Germans and the French, going back, if you like, to the 1870s, to the Franco-Prussian War. First World War, the Second World War were uh, obviously world wars, but also wars in mainland Europe. So this begs the question, if we are to achieve peace in mainland Europe, or at least Western Europe, and certainly since 1945, as far as Western Europe is concerned, there has been a period of peace, then the issue may be how one brings together those nations that would uh, otherwise be fighting each other in peaceful relationships. So if one looks at the roots of the European Union, one can perhaps appreciate that it's a Franco-German endeavour. The British have, perhaps to the uh, detriment of the British, always been rather uncomfortably sat to the side of this process, but the fundamental historical roots are perhaps in German-French relationships the desire for a lasting peace after the Second World War. The other thing that we perhaps need to consider if we're thinking about the some general issues in relation to the European Union is the nature of the Union itself. Now, the Union, as I think I've mentioned earlier in this series of lectures, is a trade block. It's um, a, 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 a single market that stretches from the west coast of Ireland to the Urals, a massive trade block, if you like. Um, this offsets, in some ways, the American trade block on one side and the Asian trade block on the other side, or on the other, other hand. What we have, then, is perhaps an economic prerogative that underlies the European Union, that for European nation-states to be world players, to be part of a world market, they need to combine together to produce a union. That might be one particular defence of one of the underlying reasons why the European Union exists. I suppose the other thing that we need to bear in mind here, and if we look at the foundational treaty, the Treaty of Rome of 1957, and subsequent developments uh, in European Union law, what we perhaps see is a commitment to rights. Now, let me clarify a point almost immediately. Although the EU contains within it rights that we could see as human rights, we're not obviously talking here about the Convention, the European Convention on Human Rights. I'm going to talk about that presently, but let's keep our focus on the European Union. My point for the moment is that although the European Union is, if you like, a trade block, an economic uh, organisation, it's also committed to other values, those foundational values, the free movement of people, uh, goods and services throughout the region, obviously brings with it certain social rights. And I think if one looks at the development of uh, the European Union, one can see increasingly uh, in a commitment to an appreciation of the importance of rights to economic organisation. This, however, is a massive theme and one that I can't touch upon in any great detail. However, in order to organise our discussion of the European Union. I do want to use rights and human rights, or those human rights that are important to the Union, as a guiding thread. This may be contrary to what other commentators or other lectures do, but I think uh, what I want to try and suggest is that the EU is an ongoing experiment, an ongoing um, legal and political experiment. And one of the interesting things that we see in recent years 
is an increasing commitment, centrality to the EU, of human rights as a way of expressing what is fundamental, fundamental values to uh, the European Union, and also the way in which these rights uh, interface with the institutions of the Union. I'm aware that there's counter-arguments, I'm aware that this is in itself a, a partial perspective, but I think it at least gives us a, a guiding thread to think about what would otherwise, and often this is the way that this material is presented uh, in courses, simply a kind of set of snapshots about what the institutions of the Union do. I don't want to do that, I want to suggest that there is some rationale that lies behind it. Of course there's a great deal of technical complexity here, but I don't want to surrender and say, oh, it's just too complex to understand. I want to say, here are some guiding ideas. Here are some ideas, here are some values that are important to the functioning, the structure, and the self-understanding of the European Union. And the second point here, I think, is an equally important one. This is experimental. This is an experimental engagement with supranational organisation. For in all its technical complexity, I think one has to see it as an unfinished project or a work in process. And I want to try and pick up on some of these points as we go along. Let's have some orientating points, first of all. Now, the union is, of course, a creature of law. It's, it lies, its existence lies in treaties, the foundational one. Um, I've just mentioned the Treaty of Rome in 1957, which entered into force in 1958. The, this treaty has uh, since been amended by the Treaty of Amsterdam 1997 and by the Treaty of Nice in 2000, uh, the Treaty of Nice of 2001. That gives us some sense of the constitutional treaties, the fundamental treaties that uh, set up, if you like, the legal back, uh, backbone of the European Union. What I want to do for the most part, though, is to look at the Charter of fundamental rights. This picks up on some of the themes I was uh, talking about earlier on. It also allows us to link together the past of the Union with its present and possibly its future because it forces us to think about the relationship between the Foundational Treaty of Rome, the rights in the Foundational Treaty of Rome, and the rights that are in the fundamental charter. So it seems to me that it's an important interpretive tool for understanding a number of themes in relation to the European Union. So the first thing that I want to draw our attention to is, the, is a section drawn from the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And I just want to um, read out the following paragraph from Annex 4 of the Charter. Quote, Protection of fundamental rights as a founding principle of the Union and an indispensable prerequisite for her legitimacy. The obligations of the Union to respect fundamental rights have been confirmed and defined by the jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice. There appears to be a need at the present stage of the Union's development to establish a charter of fundamental rights in order to make their overriding importance and relevance more visible to the Union's citizens. Now I want to comment on the wording of Annex 4 to the Charter of Fundamental Rights, but I want to just say a little bit about the background out of which, or the historical context out of which the Charter appears. The, and I want to do this in order to see why the Union is using this language of human rights, why it has come to the centre. There are at least two distinct concerns. First, since the foundation of the Union, there's been a growing sense that its institutions, which I'll talk about in a moment, remain opaque and somewhat distant from those whose lives they govern. The incomprehension and distrust of the Union ex has expressed itself, and I think continues to express itself, in the politics of different member states. We could then talk of, if you like, a legitimacy gap um, between the appreciation of, or between the way in which citizens view the institutions of the Union and what those institutions are actually doing. For most people, these un the Union institutions do not appear to be legitimate. Commitment to human rights provides at least one way of stressing that the Union is transparent, accountable, and dedicated to the rule of law. In other words, it goes some way to addressing that legitimacy gap. 
So that's one reason why the Fundamental Charter appears, one reason why human rights become so important to the European Union. The second concern relates to the expansion of the Union to include nations that had been under communist or state socialist control prior to the collapse of the USSR. The economic and political restructuring necessary for membership in the Union required the EU, the European Union, to stress its own democratic credentials and to promulgate those doctrines in the management of affairs of new member states. So here's a thing to think about. The Union, if we date it from uh, the Treaty of Rome of 57, is one thing. Nobody in 1957 could perhaps have anticipated the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the so-called Soviet Empire. Now, that obviously occurs at a much later period in post-war European history. Once those uh, nations that had been under the uh, control of the Soviet Union, satellite states if you like, uh, begin to join the Union, it's clearly going to change the dynamic of uh, a political and legal uh, uh, collection of um, uh, super uh, national set of institutions which had developed in an earlier context, outside or within that Cold War context. So this is necessarily going to change the Union. So we've got these two themes possibly interacting here. We've got this concern, first of all, with the legitimacy gap, and we've got, secondly, the expansion of the Union to include those former uh, Soviet bloc nations who now join or want to join or join the European Union. Human rights seem a way of addressing both of these concerns. Let's then go back to the wording of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, having at least thought a little bit about its context. So, back to this quote. Protection of fundamental rights is a founding principle of the Union and an indispensable prerequisite for her legitimacy. So we can perhaps see now why the language of legitimacy appears within the terms of the Charter. It goes on to say, the obligation of the Union to respect fundamental rights has been confirmed and defined by the jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice. Remember this is the European Court of Justice, we're not talking about the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, we're talking about the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg and what the Charter of Fundamental Rights is telling us is that those rights that are specific to the Union are now part of the jurisprudence, the case law, the rules, the principles which the European Court of Justice is developing. The Charter goes on to say, there appears to be a need at the present stage of the Union's development to establish this Charter in order to make their overriding importance and relevance more visible to the Union's citizens. We have, after all, citizens of this Union. One has to see it in these terms. In other words, the concept of a citizen is not just linked to a notion of a trade bloc. One would think that citizens have rights, citizens demand things like the rule of law, the transparency of the institutions that govern them. So what we can see, I think, in the Charter is a number of things coming together. To refer to the citizens of the Union is in its of itself an important development. Yeah.